The Whisperer in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft One. Bear in mind closely that I did not see any actual visual horror at the end. To say that a mental shock was the cause of what I inferred, that last straw which sent me racing out of the lonely Akeley farmhouse and through the wild-domed hills of Vermont in a commandeered motor at night, is to ignore the plainest facts of my final experience. Notwithstanding the deep extent to which I shared the information and speculations of Henry Akeley, the things I saw and heard and the admitted vividness of the impression produced on me by these things, I cannot prove even now whether I was right or wrong in my hideous inference. For after all, Akeley's disappearance establishes nothing. People found nothing amiss in his house, despite the bullet marks on the outside and inside. It was just as though he had walked out casually for a ramble in the hills and failed to return. There was not even a sign that a guest had been there, or that those horrible cylinders and machines had been stored in the study. That he had mortally feared the crowded green hills and endless trickle of brooks among which he had been born and reared means nothing at all either, for thousands are subject to just such morbid fears. Eccentricity, moreover, could easily account for his strange acts and apprehensions toward the last. The whole matter began, so far as I am concerned, with the historic and unprecedented Vermont floods of November 3, 1927. I was then, as now, an instructor of literature at Miskatonic University in Arkham, Massachusetts, and an enthusiastic amateur student of New England folklore. Shortly after the flood, amidst the varied reports of hardship, suffering, and organized relief which filled the press, there appeared certain odd stories of things found floating in some of the swollen rivers, so that many of my friends embarked on curious discussions and appealed to me to shed what light I could on the subject. I felt flattered at having my folklore study taken so seriously, and did what I could to belittle the wild, vague tales which seemed so clearly an outgrowth of old rustic superstitions. It amused me to find several persons of education who insisted that some stratum of obscure, distorted fact might underlie the rumors. The tales thus brought to my notice came mostly through newspaper cuttings, though one yarn had an oral source and was repeated to a friend of mine in a letter from his mother in Hardwick, Vermont. The type of thing described was essentially the same in all cases, though there seemed to be three separate instances involved, one connected with the Winooski River near Montpelier, another attached to the West River in Wyndham County beyond Newfane, and a third centering in the Pesumpsic in Caledonia County above Lindenville. Of course, many of the stray items mentioned other instances, but on analysis they all seemed to boil down to these three. In each case, country folk reported seeing one or more very bizarre and disturbing objects in the surging waters that poured down from the unfrequented hills, and there was a widespread tendency to connect these sites with a primitive, half-forgotten cycle of whispered legend which old people resurrected for the occasion. What people thought they saw were organic shapes, not quite like any they had ever seen before. Naturally, there were many human bodies washed along by the streams in that tragic period, but those who described these strange shapes felt quite sure that they were not human, despite some superficial resemblances in size and general outline. Nor, said the witnesses, could they have been any kind of animal known to Vermont. They were pinkish things, about five feet long, with crustaceous bodies bearing vast pairs of dorsal fins or membranous wings and several sets of articulated limbs, and with a sort of convoluted ellipsoid covered with multitudes of very short antennae where a head would ordinarily be. It was really remarkable how closely the reports from different sources tended to coincide, though the wonder was lessened by the fact that the old legends shared at one time throughout the hill country furnished a morbidly vivid picture which might well have colored the imaginations of all the witnesses concerned. It was my conclusion that such witnesses, in every case naive and simple backwoods folk, had glimpsed the battered and bloated bodies of human beings or farm animals in the whirling currents and had allowed the half-remembered folklore to invest these pitiful objects with fantastic attributes. 
The ancient folklore, while cloudy, evasive, and largely forgotten by the present generation, was of a highly singular character, and obviously reflected the influence of still earlier Indian tales. I knew it well, though I had never been in Vermont, through the exceedingly rare monograph of Eli Davenport, which embraces material orally obtained prior to 1839 among the oldest people of the state. This material, moreover, closely coincided with tales which I had personally heard from elderly rustics in the mountains of New Hampshire. Briefly summarized, it hinted at a hidden race of monstrous beings which lurked somewhere among the remoter hills in the deep woods of the highest peaks and the dark valleys where streams trickle from unknown sources. These beings were seldom glimpsed, but evidences of their presence were reported by those who had ventured farther than usual up the slopes of certain mountains or into certain deep, steep-sided gorges that even the wolves shunned. There were queer footprints, or claw prints, in the mud of brook margins and barren patches, and curious circles of stones, with the grass around them worn away, which did not seem to have been placed or entirely shaped by nature. There were, too, certain caves of problematical depth in the sides of the hills, with mouths closed by boulders in a manner scarcely accidental, and with more than an average quota of the queer prints leading both toward and away from them, if indeed the direction of these prints could be justly estimated. And worst of all, there were the things which adventurous people had seen very rarely in the twilight of the remotest valleys in the dense perpendicular woods above the limits of normal hill climbing. It would have been less uncomfortable if the stray accounts of these things had not agreed so well. As it was, nearly all the rumors had several points in common, averring that the creatures were a sort of huge, light red crab with many pairs of legs and with two great bat-like wings in the middle of the back. They sometimes walked on all their legs and sometimes on the hindmost pair only, using the others to convey large objects of indeterminate nature. On one occasion they were spied in considerable numbers, a detachment of them wading along a shallow woodland watercourse three abreast in evidently disciplined formation. Once a specimen was seen flying, launching itself from the top of a bald, lonely hill at night and vanishing in the sky after its great flapping wings had been silhouetted an instant against the full moon. These things seemed content on the whole to let mankind alone, though they were at times held responsible for the disappearance of venturesome individuals, especially persons who built houses too close to certain valleys or too high up on certain mountains. Many localities came to be known as inadvisable to settle in, the feeling persisting long after the cause was forgotten. People would look up at some of the neighboring mountain precipices with a shudder, even when not recalling how many settlers had been lost and how many farmhouses burnt to ashes on the lower slopes of those grim green sentinels. But while according to the earliest legends the creatures would appear to have harmed only those trespassing on their privacy, there were later accounts of their curiosity respecting men and of their attempts to establish secret outposts in the human world. There were tales of the queer claw prints seen around farmhouse windows in the morning, and of occasional disappearances in regions outside the obviously haunted areas. Tales, besides, of buzzing voices in imitation of human speech, which made surprising offers to lone travelers on roads and cart paths in the deep woods, and of children frightened out of their wits by things seen or heard where the primal forest pressed close upon their dooryards. In the final layer of legends, the layer just preceding the decline of superstition and the abandonment of close contact with the dreaded places, there are shocked references to hermits and remote farmers who at some period of life appeared to have undergone a repellent mental change, and who were shunned and whispered about as mortals who had sold themselves to the strange beings. In one of the northeastern counties, it seemed to be a fashion about 1800 to accuse eccentric and unpopular recluses of being allies or representatives of the abhorred things. As to what the things were, explanations naturally varied. The common name applied to them was those ones or the old ones, though other terms had a local and transient use. Perhaps the bulk of the Puritan settlers set them down bluntly as familiars of the devil and made them a basis of awed theological speculation. 
Those with Celtic legendry in their heritage, mainly the Scotch-Irish element of New Hampshire, and their kindred, who had settled in Vermont on Governor Wentworth's colonial grants, linked them vaguely with the malign fairies and little people of the bogs and raths, and protected themselves with scraps of incantation handed down through many generations. But the Indians had the most fantastic theories of all. While different tribal legends differed, there was a marked consensus of belief in certain vital particulars, it being unanimously agreed that the creatures were not native to this earth. The Pennycook myths, which were the most consistent and picturesque, taught that the winged ones came from the great bear in the sky and had mines in our earthly hills whence they took a kind of stone they could not get on any other world. They did not live here, said the myths, but merely maintained outposts and flew back with vast cargoes of stone to their own stars in the north. They harmed only those earth people who got too near them or spied upon them. Animals shunned them through instinctive hatred, not because of being hunted. They could not eat the things and animals of earth, but brought their own food from the stars. It was bad to get near them, and sometimes young hunters who went into their hills never came back. It was not good either to listen to what they whispered at night in the forest with voices like a bee's that tried to be like the voices of men. They knew the speech of all kinds of men, Pennycooks, Hurons, men of the five nations, but did not seem to have or need any speech of their own. They talked with their heads, which changed color in different ways to mean different things. All the legendary, of course, white and Indian alike, died down during the 19th century, except for occasional atavistical flare-ups. The ways of the Vermonters became settled, and once their habitual paths and dwellings were established according to a certain fixed plan, they remembered less and less what fears and avoidances had determined that plan, and even that there had been any fears or avoidances. Most people simply knew that certain hilly regions were considered as highly unhealthy, unprofitable, and generally unlucky to live in, and that the farther one kept from them, the better off one usually was. In time, the ruts of custom and economic interest became so deeply cut in approved places that there was no longer any reason for going outside them, and the haunted hills were left deserted by accident rather than by design. Save during infrequent local scares, only wonder-loving grandmothers and retrospective nonagenarians ever whispered of beings dwelling in those hills. And even such whisperers admitted that there was not much to fear from those things now that they were used to the presence of houses and settlements, and now that human beings let their chosen territory severely alone. All this I had known from my reading, and from certain folk tales picked up in New Hampshire, Hence, when the flood-time rumors began to appear, I could easily guess what imaginative background had evolved them. I took great pains to explain this to my friends, and was correspondingly amused when several contentious souls continued to insist on a possible element of truth in the reports. Such persons tried to point out that the early legends had a significant persistence and uniformity, and that the virtually unexplored nature of the Vermont hills made it unwise to be dogmatic about what might or might not dwell among them. Nor could they be silenced by my assurance that all the myths were of a well-known pattern common to most of mankind, and determined by early phases of imaginative experience which always produced the same type of delusion. It was of no use to demonstrate to such opponents that the Vermont myths differed but little, in essence, from those universal legends of natural personification which filled the ancient world with fauns and dryads and satyrs, suggested the Calicanzari of modern Greece, and gave to wild whales and Ireland their dark hints of strange, small, and terrible hidden races of troglodytes and burrowers. No use either to point out the even more startlingly similar belief of the Nepalese hill tribes in the dreaded Migo, or abominable snowmen, who lurk hideously amidst the ice and rock pinnacles of the Himalayan summits. When I brought up this evidence, my opponents turned it against me by claiming that it must imply some actual historicity for the ancient tales— that it must argue the real existence of some queer elder earth race driven to hiding after the advent and dominance of mankind, which might very conceivably have survived in reduced numbers to relatively recent times or even to the present. 
The more I laughed at such theories, the more these stubborn friends asseverated them, adding that even without the heritage of legend, the recent reports were too clear, consistent, detailed, and sanely prosaic in manner of telling to be completely ignored. Two or three fanatical extremists went so far as to hint at possible meanings in the ancient Indian tales, which gave the hidden beings a non-terrestrial origin, citing the extravagant books of Charles Fort with their claims that voyagers from other worlds and outer space have often visited Earth. Most of my foes, however, were merely romanticists, who insisted on trying to transfer to real life the fantastic lore of lurking little people made popular by the magnificent horror fiction of Arthur Mackin. 2. As was only natural under the circumstances, this piquant debating finally got into print in the form of letters to the Arkham Advertiser, some of which were copied in the press of those Vermont regions whence the flood stories came. The Rutland Herald gave half a page of extracts from the letters on both sides, while the Brattleboro Reformer reprinted one of my long historical and mythological summaries in full, with some accompanying comments in the Pendrifter's thoughtful column which supported and applauded my skeptical conclusions. By the spring of 1928 I was almost a well-known figure in Vermont, notwithstanding the fact that I had never set foot in the state. Then came the challenging letters from Henry Akeley, which impressed me so profoundly, and which took me for the first and last time to that fascinating realm of crowded green precipices and muttering forest streams. Most of what I now know of Henry Wentworth Akeley was gathered by correspondence with his neighbors and with his only son in California after my experience in his lonely farmhouse. He was, I discovered, the last representative on his home soil of a long, locally distinguished line of jurists, administrators, and gentlemen agriculturalists. In him, however, the family mentally had veered away from practical affairs to pure scholarship so that he had been a notable student of mathematics, astronomy, biology, anthropology, and folklore at the University of Vermont. I had never previously heard of him, and he did not give many autobiographical details in his communications, but from the first I saw he was a man of character, education, and intelligence, albeit a recluse with very little worldly sophistication. Despite the incredible nature of what he claimed, I could not help at once taking Akeley more seriously than I had taken any of the other challengers of my views. For one thing, he was really close to the actual phenomena, visible and tangible, that he speculated so grotesquely about. And for another thing, he was amazingly willing to leave his conclusions in a tentative state, like a true man of science. He had no personal preferences to advance, and was always guided by what he took to be solid evidence. Of course, I began by considering him mistaken, but gave him credit for being intelligently mistaken, and at no time did I emulate some of his friends in attributing his ideas and his fear of the lonely green hills to insanity. I could see that there was a great deal to the man, and knew that what he reported must surely come from strange circumstances deserving investigation, however little it might have to do with the fantastic causes he assigned. Later on, I received from him certain material proofs which placed the matter on a somewhat different and bewilderingly bizarre basis. I cannot do better than transcribe in full, so far as is possible, the long letter in which Akeley introduced himself, and which formed such an important landmark in my own intellectual history. It is no longer in my possession, but my memory holds almost every word of its portentous message— and again I affirm my confidence in the sanity of the man who wrote it. Here is the text, a text which reached me in the cramped, archaic-looking scrawl of one who had obviously not mingled much with the world during his sedate, scholarly life. RFD No. 2, Townsend, Wyndham County, Vermont. May 5, 1928, Albert N. Wilmoth, Esquire, 118 Saltonstall Street, Arkham, Massachusetts. My dear sir, I have read with great interest the Brattleboro Reformer's reprint, April 23rd, 28, of your letter on the recent stories of strange bodies seen floating in our flooded streams last fall, and on the curious folklore they so well agree with. It is easy to see why an outlander would take the position you take, and even why Pendrifter agrees with you. 
That is the attitude generally taken by educated persons both in and out of Vermont, and was my own attitude as a young man, I am now fifty-seven, before my studies, both general and in Davenport's book, led me to do some exploring in parts of the hills hereabouts not usually visited. I was directed towards such studies by the queer old tales I used to hear from elderly farmers of the more ignorant sort, but now I wish I had let the whole matter alone. I might say, with all proper modesty, that the subject of anthropology and folklore is by no means strange to me. I took a good deal of it at college, and am familiar with most of the standard authorities, such as Tyler, Lubbock, Fraser, Quatrefage, Murray, Osborne, Keith, Boole, G. Elliot Smith, and so on. It is no news to me that tales of hidden races are as old as all mankind. I have seen the reprints of letters from you, and those arguing with you, in the Rutland Herald, and guess I know about where your controversy stands at the present time. What I desire to say now is that I am afraid your adversaries are nearer right than yourself, even though all reason seems to be on your side. They are nearer right than they realize themselves, for of course they go only by theory and cannot know what I know. If I knew as little of the matter as they, I would not feel justified in believing as they do. I would be wholly on your side. You can see that I'm having a hard time getting to the point, probably because I really dread getting to the point, but the upshot of the matter is that I have certain evidence that monstrous things do indeed live in the woods on the high hills which nobody visits. I have not seen any of the things floating in the rivers, as reported, but I have seen things like them under circumstances I dread to repeat. I have seen footprints, and of late have seen them nearer my own home. I live in the old Akeley place south of Townsend Village on the side of Dark Mountain than I dare to tell you now. And I have overheard voices in the woods at certain points that I will not even begin to describe on paper. At one place I heard them so much that I took a phonograph there with a dictaphone attachment and wax blank, and I shall try to arrange to have you hear the record I got. I have run it on the machine for some of the old people up here, and one of the voices had nearly scared them paralyzed by reason of its likeness to a certain voice, that buzzing voice in the woods which Davenport mentions, that their grandmothers have told about and mimicked for them. I know what most people think of a man who tells about hearing voices, but before you draw conclusions, just listen to this record and ask some of the older backwoods people what they think of it. If you can account for it normally, very well, but there must be something behind it. Ex nihilo nihil fit, you know. Now, my object in writing you is not to start an argument, but to give you information, which I think a man of your tastes will find deeply interesting. This is private. Publicly, I'm on your side, for certain things show me that it does not do for people to know too much about these matters. My own studies are now wholly private, and I would not think of saying anything to attract people's attention and cause them to visit the places I have explored. It is true, terribly true, that there are non-human creatures watching us all the time, with spies among us gathering information. It is from a wretched man who, if he was sane, as I think he was, was one of those spies, that I got a large part of my clues to the matter. He later killed himself, but I have reason to think there are others now. The things come from another planet, being able to live in interstellar space and fly through it on clumsy, powerful wings which have a way of resisting the ether, but which are too poor at steering to be of much use in helping them about on Earth. I will tell you about this later if you do not dismiss me at once as a madman. They come here to get metals from mines that go deep under the hills, and I think I know where they come from. They will not hurt us if we let them alone, but no one can say what will happen if we get too curious about them. Of course, a good army of men could wipe out their mining colony, that is what they are afraid of. But if that happened, more would come from outside, any number of them. They could easily conquer the earth, but have not tried so far because they have not needed to. They would rather leave things as they are to save Barber. I think they mean to get rid of me because of what I have discovered. There is a great black stone with unknown hieroglyphics half-worn away which I found in the woods on Round Hill east of here, and after I took it home everything became different. If they think I suspect too much, they will either kill me or take me off the earth to where they come from. They like to take away men of learning once in a while to keep informed on the state of things in the human world. 
This leads me to my secondary purpose in addressing you, namely to urge you to hush up the present debate rather than give it more publicity. People must be kept away from these hills, and in order to effect this, their curiosity ought not to be aroused any further. Heaven knows there is peril enough anyway, with promoters and real estate men flooding Vermont with herds of summer people to overrun the wild places and cover the hills with cheap bungalows. I shall welcome further communication with you and shall try to send you that phonograph record and black stone, which is so worn that photographs don't show much, by express, if you are willing. I say try, because I think those creatures have a way of tampering with things round here. There is a sullen, furtive fellow named Brown on a farm near the village who I think is their spy. Little by little they are trying to cut me off from our world because I know too much about their world. They have the most amazing way of finding out what I do. You may not even get this letter. I think I shall have to leave this part of the country and go to live with my son in San Diego, California, if things get any worse. But it is not easy to give up the place you were born in, and where your family has lived for six generations. Also, I would hardly dare sell this house to anybody now that the creatures have taken notice of it. They seem to be trying to get the black stone back and destroy the phonograph record, but I shall not let them if I can help it. My great police dogs always hold them back, for there are very few here as yet, and they are clumsy in getting about. As I have said, their wings are not much use for short flights on Earth. I am on the very brink of deciphering that stone in a very terrible way, and with your knowledge of folklore, you may be able to supply missing links enough to help me. I suppose you know all about the fearful myths antedating the coming of man to the Earth, the yog sothoth and Cthulhu cycles which I hinted at in the Necronomicon. <laughs> I had access to a copy of that once, and hear that you have one in your college library under lock and key. To conclude, Mr. Wilmarth, I think that with our respective studies we can be very useful to each other. I don't wish to put you in any peril, and suppose I ought to warn you that possession of the stone and the record won't be very safe, but I think you will find any risks worth running for the sake of knowledge. I will drive down to Newfane or Brattleboro to send whatever you authorize me to send, for the express offices there are more to be trusted. I might say that I live quite alone now, since I can't keep hired help any more. They won't stay because of the things that try to get near the house at night and that keep the dogs barking continually. I'm glad I didn't get as deep as this into the business while my wife was alive, for it would have driven her mad. Hoping that I am not bothering you unduly, and that you will decide to get in touch with me rather than throw this letter into the wastebasket as a madman's raving, I am, yours very truly, Henry W. Akeley. P.S. I am making some extra prints of certain photographs taken by me, which I think will help to prove a number of the points I have touched on. The old people think they are monstrously true. I will send you these very soon, if you are interested. H.W.A. It would be difficult to describe my sentiments upon reading this strange document for the first time. By all ordinary rules, I ought to have laughed more loudly at these extravagances than at the far milder theories which had previously moved me to mirth. Yet something in the tone of the letter made me take it with paradoxical seriousness. Not that I believed for a moment in the hidden race from the stars which my correspondent spoke of, but that after some grave preliminary doubts I grew to feel oddly sure of his sanity and sincerity, and of his confrontation by some genuine though singular and abnormal phenomenon which he could not explain except in this imaginative way. It could not be as he thought it, I reflected, yet on the other hand it could not be otherwise than worthy of investigation. The man seemed unduly excited and alarmed about something, but it was hard to think that all cause was lacking. He was so specific and logical in certain ways. And after all, his yarn did fit in so perplexingly well with some of the old myths, even the wildest Indian legends, that he had really overheard disturbing voices in the hills and had really found the black stone he spoke about was wholly possible, despite the crazy inferences he had made, inferences probably suggested by the man who had claimed to be a spy of the outer beings and had later killed himself. It was easy to deduce that this man must have been wholly insane, but that he probably had a streak of perverse outward logic which made the naive Akeley, already prepared for such things by his folklore studies, believe his tale. 
As for the latest developments, it appeared from his inability to keep hired help that Akeley's humbler rustic neighbors were as convinced as he that his house was besieged by uncanny things at night. The dogs really barked, too. And then the matter of that phonograph record, which I could not but believe he had obtained in the way he said. It must mean something, whether animal noises deceptively like human speech, or the speech of some hidden, night-haunting human being decayed to a state not much above that of lower animals. From this, my thoughts went back to the black hieroglyphed stone, and to speculations upon what it might mean. And too, what of the photographs which Akeley said he was about to send, and which the old people had found so convincingly terrible? As I reread the cramped handwriting, I felt as never before that my credulous opponents might have more on their side than I had conceded. After all, there might be some queer and perhaps hereditarily misshapen outcasts in those shunned hills, even though no such race of star-born monsters as folklore claimed. And if there were, then the presence of strange bodies in the flooded streams would not be wholly beyond belief. Was it too presumptuous to suppose that both the old legends and the recent reports had this much of reality behind them? But even as I harbored these doubts, I felt ashamed that so fantastic a piece of bizarrery as Henry Akeley's wild letter had brought them up. In the end, I answered Akeley's letter, adopting a tone of friendly interest and soliciting further particulars. His reply came almost by return mail, and contained, true to promise, a number of Kodak views of scenes and objects illustrating what he had to tell. Glancing at these pictures as I took them from the envelope, I felt a curious sense of fright and nearness to forbidden things. For in spite of the vagueness of most of them, they had a damnably suggestive power which was intensified by the fact of their being genuine photographs, actual optical links with what they portrayed, and the product of an impersonal transmitting process without prejudice, fallibility, or mendacity. The more I looked at them, the more I saw that my serious estimate of Akeley and his story had not been unjustified. Certainly these pictures carried conclusive evidence of something in the Vermont Hills, which was at least vastly outside the radius of our common knowledge and belief. The worst thing of all was the footprint, the view taken where the sun shone on a mud patch somewhere in a deserted upland. This was no cheaply counterfeited thing I could see at a glance, for the sharply defined pebbles and grass blades in the field of vision gave a clear index of scale and left no possibility of a tricky double exposure. I have called the thing a footprint, but claw print would be a better term. Even now I can scarcely describe it, save to say that it was hideously crab-like and that there seemed to be some ambiguity about its direction. It was not a very deep or fresh print, but seemed to be about the size of an average man's foot. From a central pad, pairs of saw-toothed nippers projected in opposite directions, quite baffling as to function, if indeed the whole object were exclusively an organ of locomotion. Another photograph, evidently a time exposure taken in deep shadow, was of the mouth of a woodland cave, with a boulder of rounded regularity choking the aperture. On the bare ground in front of it, one could just discern a dense network of curious tracks. And when I studied the picture with a magnifier, I felt uneasily sure that the tracks were like the one in the other view. A third picture showed a druid-like circle of standing stones on the summit of a wild hill. Around the cryptic circle, the grass was very much beaten down and worn away, though I could not detect any footprints, even with the glass. The extreme remoteness of the place was apparent from the veritable sea of tenantless mountains which formed the background and stretched away toward a misty horizon. But if the most disturbing of all the views was that of the footprint, the most curiously suggestive was that of the great black stone found in the Round Hill Woods. Akeley had photographed it on what was evidently his study table, for I could see rows of books and a bust of Milton in the background. The thing, as nearly as one might guess, had faced the camera vertically with a somewhat irregularly curved surface of one by two feet. But to say anything definite about that surface or about the general shape of the whole mass almost defies the power of language. What outlandish geometrical principles had guided its cutting, for artificially cut it surely was, I could not even begin to guess, and never before had I seen anything which struck me as so strangely and unmistakably alien to this world. Of the hieroglyphics on the surface I could discern very few, but one or two that I did see gave me rather a shock. 
Of course, they might be fraudulent, for others besides myself had read the monstrous and abhorred Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al Hazred. But it nevertheless made me shiver to recognize certain ideographs which study had taught me to link with the most blood curdling and blasphemous whispers of things that had had a kind of mad half existence before the earth and the other inner worlds of the solar system were made. Of the five remaining pictures, three were of swamp and hill scenes which seemed to bear traces of hidden and unwholesome tendency. Another was of a queer mark in the ground very near Akeley's house, which he said he had photographed the morning after a night on which the dogs had barked more violently than usual. It was very blurred, and one could really draw no certain conclusions from it, but it did seem fiendishly like that other mark or claw print photographed on the deserted upland. The final picture was of the Akeley place itself, a trim white house of two stories and attic, about a century and a quarter old, and with a well-kept lawn and stone-bordered path leading up to a tastefully carved Georgian doorway. There were several huge police dogs on the lawn, squatting near a pleasant-faced man with a close-cropped gray beard, whom I took to be Akeley himself, his own photographer, one might infer, from the tube-connected bulb in his right hand. From the pictures I turned to the bulky, closely written letter itself, and for the next three hours was immersed in a gulf of unutterable horror. Where Akeley had given only outlines before, he now entered into minute details, presenting long transcripts of words overheard in the woods at night, long accounts of monstrous pinkish forms spied in thickets at twilight on the hills, and a terrible cosmic narrative derived from the application of profound and varied scholarship to the endless bygone discourses of the mad, self-styled spy who had killed himself. I found myself faced by names and terms that I had heard elsewhere in the most hideous of connections. Yagoth, Great Cthulhu, Sathagua, Yog sathoth Relay, Nyarlahotep, Azathoth, Hastur, Yan, Leng, the Lake of Hali, Bethmura, the Yellow Sign, Lemur Cthulhos, Bran, and the Magnum in Omenandum, and was drawn back through nameless eons and inconceivable dimensions to worlds of elder outer entity at which the crazed author of the Necronomicon had only guessed in the vaguest way. I was told of the pits of primal life and of the streams that had trickled down therefrom, and finally of the tiny rivulet from one of those streams which had become entangled with the destinies of our own earth. My brain whirled, and where before I had attempted to explain things away, I now began to believe in the most abnormal and incredible wonders. The array of vital evidence was damnably vast and overwhelming, and the cool scientific attitude of Akeley, an attitude removed as far as imaginable from the demented, the fanatical, the hysterical, or even the extravagantly speculative, had a tremendous effect on my thought and judgment. By the time I laid the frightful letter aside, I could understand the fears he had come to entertain and was ready to do anything in my power to keep people away from those wild, haunted hills. Even now, when time has dulled the impression and made me half-question my own experience and horrible doubts, there are things in that letter of Akeley's which I would not quote or even form into words on paper. I am almost glad that the letter and record and photographs are gone now, and I wish, for reasons I shall soon make clear, that the new planet beyond Neptune had not been discovered. With the reading of that letter, my public debating about the Vermont horror permanently ended. Arguments from opponents remained unanswered or put off with promises, and eventually the controversy petered out into oblivion. During late May and June, I was in constant correspondence with Akeley, though once in a while a letter would be lost so that we would have to retrace our ground and perform considerable laborious copying. What we were trying to do as a whole was to compare notes in matters of obscure mythological scholarship and arrive at a clearer correlation of the Vermont horrors with the general body of primitive world legend. For one thing, we virtually decided that these morbidities and the hellish Himalayan Migo were one and the same order of incarnated nightmare. There were also absorbing zoological conjectures, which I would have referred to Professor Dexter in my own college, but for Akeley's imperative command to tell no one of the matter before us. If I seem to disobey that command now, it is only because I think that at this stage a warning about those farther Vermont hills, and about those Himalayan peaks which bold explorers are more and more determined to ascend, 
is more conducive to public safety than silence would be. One specific thing we were leading up to was a deciphering of the hieroglyphics on that infamous black stone, a deciphering which might well place us in possession of secrets deeper and more dizzying than any formerly known to man. 3. Toward the end of June, the phonograph record came, shipped from Brattleboro, since Akeley was unwilling to trust conditions on the branch line north of there. He had begun to feel an increased sense of espionage, aggravated by the loss of some of our letters, and said much about the insidious deeds of certain men whom he considered tools and agents of the hidden beings. Most of all, he suspected the surly farmer Walter Brown, who lived alone on a run-down hillside place near the deep woods, and who was often seen loafing around corners in Brattleboro, Bellows Falls, Newfane, and South Londonderry in the most inexplicable and seemingly unmotivated way. Brown's voice, he felt convinced, was one of those he had overheard on a certain occasion in a very terrible conversation, and he had once found a footprint or claw print near Brown's house, which might possess the most ominous significance. It had been curiously near some of Brown's own footprints, footprints that faced toward it. So the record was shipped from Brattleboro, whither Akeley drove in his Ford car along the lonely Vermont back roads. He confessed in an accompanying note that he was beginning to be afraid of those roads, and that he would not even go into Townsend for supplies now except in broad daylight. It did not pay, he repeated again and again, to know too much unless one were very remote from those silent and problematical hills. He would be going to California pretty soon to live with his son, though it was hard to leave a place where all one's memories and ancestral feelings centered. Before trying the record on the commercial machine which I borrowed from the college administration building, I carefully went over all the explanatory matter in Akeley's various letters. This record, he had said, was obtained about 1 a.m. on the 1st of May, 1915, near the closed mouth of a cave where the wooded west slope of Dark Mountain rises out of Lee's Swamp. The place had always been unusually plagued with strange voices, this being the reason he had brought the phonograph, dictaphone, and blank in expectation of results. Former experience had told him that May Eve, the hideous Sabbat night of underground European legend, would probably be more fruitful than any other date, and he was not disappointed. It was noteworthy, though, that he never again heard voices at that particular spot. Unlike most of the overheard forest voices, the substance of the record was quasi-ritualistic and included one palpably human voice which Akeley had never been able to place. It was not Brown's, but seemed to be that of a man of greater cultivation. The second voice, however, was the real crux of the thing, for this was the accursed buzzing, which had no likeness to humanity despite the human words which it uttered in good English grammar and a scholarly accent. The recording phonograph and dictaphone had not worked uniformly well, and had of course been at a great disadvantage because of the remote and muffled nature of the overheard ritual, so that the actual speech secured was very fragmentary. Akeley had given me a transcript of what he believed the spoken words to be, and I glanced through this again as I prepared the machine for action. The text was darkly mysterious rather than openly horrible though a knowledge of its origin and manner of gathering gave it all the associative horror which any words could well possess. I will present it here in full as I remember it, and I am fairly confident that I know it correctly by heart, not only from reading the transcript but from playing the record itself over and over again. It is not a thing which one might readily forget. Indistinguishable sounds, a cultivated male human voice, is the lord of the woods, even to and the gifts of the men of Leng. So, from the wells of night to the gulfs of space, and from the gulfs of space to the wells of night, ever the praises of great Cthulhu, of Sophagua, and of him who is not to be named. Ever their praises and abundance to the black goat of the woods, Ya Shabnigura, the goat with a thousand young. A buzzing imitation of human speech. Ya Shabnigura, the black goat of the woods with a thousand young. Human voice. And it has come to pass that the lord of the woods, being seven and nine down the onyx steps, tributes to him in the gulf, Azathoth, he of whom thou hast taught us marvels, 
on the wings of night out beyond space, out beyond the... to that whereof Yugath is the youngest child, rolling alone in black ether at the rim. Buzzing voice. Go out among men and find the ways thereof that he in the gulf may know. To Nyarla Hotep, mighty messenger, must all things be told, and he shall put on the semblance of men, the waxen mask and the robe that hides, and come down from the worlds of seven suns to mock. Human voice. Nyarla Hotep, great messenger, bringer of strange joy to Yaga through the void, father of the million favored ones, stalker among... Speech cut off by end of record. Such were the words for which I was to listen when I started the phonograph. It was with a trace of genuine dread and reluctance that I pressed the lever and heard the preliminary scratching of the sapphire point, and I was glad that the first faint fragmentary words were in a human voice, a mellow, educated voice which seemed vaguely Bostonian in accent and which was certainly not that of any native of the Vermont Hills. As I listened to the tantalizingly feeble rendering, I seemed to find the speech identical with Akeley's carefully prepared transcript. On it chanted in that mellow Bostonian voice, Ya, Shab Nigurath, the goat with a thousand young. And then I heard the other voice. To this hour, I shudder retrospectively when I think of how it struck me, prepared though I was by Akeley's accounts. Those to whom I have since described the record profess to find nothing but cheap imposture or madness in it. But could they have heard the accursed thing itself, or read the bulk of Akeley's correspondence, especially that terrible and encyclopedic second letter? I know they would think differently. It is, after all, a tremendous pity that I did not disobey Akeley and play the record for others. A tremendous pity, too, that all of his letters were lost. To me, with my first-hand impression of the actual sounds, and with my knowledge of the background and surrounding circumstances, the voice was a monstrous thing. It swiftly followed the human voice in ritualistic response, but in my imagination it was a morbid echo, winging its way across unimaginable abysses from unimaginable outer hells. It is more than two years now since I last ran off that blasphemous waxen cylinder. But at this moment, and at all other moments, I can still hear that feeble, fiendish buzzing as it reached me for the first time. Ya, Shab Nigurath, the black goat of the woods with a thousand young. But though that voice is always in my ears, I have not even yet been able to analyze it well enough for a graphic description. It was like the drone of some loathsome gigantic insect ponderously shaped into the articulate speech of an alien species, and I am perfectly certain that the organs producing it can have no resemblance to the vocal organs of man, or indeed to those of any of the mammalia. There were singularities in timbre, range, and overtones which placed this phenomenon wholly outside the sphere of humanity and earth life. Its sudden advent that first time almost stunned me, and I heard the rest of the record through in a sort of abstracted daze. When the longer passage of buzzing came, there was a sharp intensification of that feeling of blasphemous infinity which had struck me during the shorter and earlier passage. At last, the record ended abruptly during an unusually clear speech of the human and Bostonian voice, but I sat stupidly staring long after the machine had automatically stopped. I hardly need say that I gave that shocking record many another playing, and that I made exhaustive attempts at analysis and comment in comparing notes with Akeley. It would be both useless and disturbing to repeat here all that we concluded, but I may hint that we agreed in believing that we had secured a clue to the source of some of the most repulsive primordial customs in the cryptic elder religions of mankind. It seemed plain to us also that there were ancient and elaborate alliances between the hidden outer creatures and certain members of the human race. How extensive these alliances were and how their state today might compare with their state in earlier ages we had no means of guessing, yet at best there was room for a limitless amount of horrified speculation. There seemed to be an awful immemorial linkage in several definite stages betwixt man and nameless infinity. The blasphemies which appeared on Earth, it was hinted, came from the dark planet Yagoth at the rim of the solar system. But this was itself merely the populous outpost of a frightful interstellar race, whose ultimate source must lie far outside even the Einsteinian space-time continuum or greatest known cosmos. 
Meanwhile, we continued to discuss the Black Stone and the best way of getting it to Arkham, Akeley deeming it inadvisable to have me visit him at the scene of his nightmare studies. For some reason or other, Akeley was afraid to trust the thing to any ordinary or expected transportation route. His final idea was to take it across country to Bellows Falls and ship it on the Boston and Maine system through Keene and Witchenden and Fitchburg, even though this would necessitate him driving along somewhat lonelier and more forest-traversing hill roads than the main highway to Brattleboro. He said he had noticed a man around the express office at Brattleboro when he had sent the phonograph record, whose actions and expression had been far from reassuring. This man had seemed too anxious to talk with the clerks and had taken the train on which the record was shipped. Akeley confessed that he had not felt strictly at ease about that record until he heard from me of its safe receipt. About this time, the second week in July, another letter of mine went astray, as I learned through an anxious communication from Akeley. After that, he told me to address him no more at Townsend, but to send all mail in care of the general delivery at Brattleboro, whither he would make frequent trips either in his car or on the motor coach line which had lately replaced passenger service on the lagging branch railway. I could see that he was getting more and more anxious, for he went into much detail about the increased barking of the dogs on moonless nights, and about the fresh claw prints he sometimes found in the road and in the mud at the back of his farmyard when morning came. Once he told about a veritable army of prints drawn up in a line facing an equally thick and resolute line of dog tracks, and sent a loathsomely disturbing Kodak picture to prove it. That was after a night on which the dogs had outdone themselves in barking and howling. On the morning of Wednesday, July 18, I received a telegram from Bellows Falls in which Akeley said he was expressing the black stone over the B&M on train number 5508, leaving Bellows Falls at 12.15 p.m. standard time and due at the North Station in Boston at 4.12 p.m. It ought, I calculated, to get up to Arkham at least by the next noon, and accordingly I stayed in all Thursday morning to receive it. But noon came and went without its advent, and when I telephoned down to the express office, I was informed that no shipment for me had arrived. My next act, performed amidst a growing alarm, was to give a long-distance call to the express agent at the Boston North Station, and I was scarcely surprised to learn that my consignment had not appeared. Train number 5508 had pulled in only 35 minutes late on the day before, but had contained no box addressed to me. The agent promised, however, to institute a searching inquiry, and I ended the day by sending Akeley a night letter outlining the situation. With commendable promptness, a report came from the Boston office on the following afternoon, the agent telephoning as soon as he learned the facts. It seemed that the railway express clerk on number 5508 had been able to recall an incident which might have much bearing on my loss, an argument with a very curious-voiced man, lean, sandy, and rustic-looking, when the train was waiting at Keene, New Hampshire, shortly after one o'clock standard time. The man, he said, was greatly excited about a heavy box which he claimed to expect, but which was neither on the train nor entered on the company's books. He had given the name of Stanley Adams, and had had such a queerly thick, droning voice that it made the clerk abnormally dizzy and sleepy to listen to him. The clerk could not remember quite how the conversation had ended, but recalled starting into a fuller awakeness when the train began to move. The Boston agent added that this clerk was a young man of wholly unquestioned veracity and reliability, of known antecedents and long with the company. That evening I went to Boston to interview the clerk in person, having obtained his name and address from the office. He was a frank, prepossessing fellow, but I saw that he could add nothing to his original account. Oddly, he was scarcely sure that he could even recognize the strange inquirer again. Realizing that he had no more to tell, I returned to Arkham and sat up till morning writing letters to Akeley, to the express company, and to the police department and station agent in Keene. I felt that the strange-voiced man who had so queerly affected the clerk must have a pivotal place in the ominous business, and hoped that Keene Station employees and telegraph office records might tell something about him, and about how he happened to make his inquiry when and where he did. I must admit, however, that all my investigations came to nothing. The queer-voiced man had indeed been noticed around the Keene Station in the early afternoon of July 18, and one lounger seemed to couple him vaguely with a heavy box— but he was altogether unknown and had not been seen before or since. 
He had not visited the telegraph office or received any message so far as could be learned, nor had any message which might justly be considered a notice of the Blackstone's presence on number 5508 come through the office for anyone. Naturally, Akeley joined with me in conducting these inquiries and even made a personal trip to Keene to question the people around the station, but his attitude toward the matter was more fatalistic than mine. He seemed to find the loss of the box a portentous and menacing fulfillment of inevitable tendencies, and had no real hope at all of its recovery. He spoke of the undoubted telepathic and hypnotic powers of the hill creatures and their agents, and in one letter hinted that he did not believe the stone was on this earth any longer. For my part, I was duly enraged, for I had felt there was at least a chance of learning profound and astonishing things from the old blurred hieroglyphs. The matter would have rankled bitterly in my mind had not Akeley's immediately subsequent letters brought up a new phase of the whole horrible hill problem, which at once seized all my attention. The Whisperer in Darkness by H.P. Lovecraft was read by Andrew Lehman. Production by Chris Lackey and Chad Pfeiffer. Brought to you by the listeners of the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcraft.com. Tune into part two for free on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash witch house media. Thank you for your support.